actually starting unit three, by the way. So then it, these videos will be unit three point whatever. All righty. So we talked last unit about capitalism and free market economics. You know how uh, governments no longer limited you based on class for the most part, and you can kind of do what you wanted and fail or succeed based on you know how good you were and, and other factors. What were some good things about that? Because before I talk about why these had some faulty ideas, because they totally did, and we know what they are, because uh, we, we've uh, been trying to address them. What was good about uh, capitalism and free market economics compared to like, you know, the, the guilds and, and tariffs and feudalism and on common land and all that stuff? What was beneficial, at least? Anything? Like, sir, good. good. Like, Okay, yeah, I could have um, uh, market pricing is going to be better than someone randomly picking what a price should be. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So pros of capitalism. So I want to remind you about the pros before we talk about the cons, or at least free market capitalism. Okay, so I've got competitive pricing is uh, almost always going to be better than somebody randomly picking a price. And we'll actually talk about why later, too. Excellent. Oh, I'll give you money for that, by the way. Somebody else had a hand up, too. Like, yeah. uh, there's more innovation. Oh yes, okay, cool. So because no one's telling you how to do something or what to make, you can uh, come up with new ways to make it and that is always better, we know that. As soon as we start using the system, innovation just flowed <clears throat> up from it, right? That's why we had the Industrial Revolution right afterwards, it was not a coincidence, all right? So I've got way more innovation if I let people do what they want to do. Okay, what else? <clears throat> yep. There we go. We have uh, people, what we have is an increase in wealth, not just for the rich, by the way, although they do disproportionately benefit. Um, everyone, it's going to like basically, uh, what's the phrase, they, like a rising tide or something like that, uh, how it lifts sort of everybody at least a bit. And yes, one of the points is that the people that run these companies benefit way more, totally true, uh, but it still does increase the amount of money um, and availability of goods for everybody and these decreased prices. That's why, by the way, somebody who uh, is unemployed nowadays, it likely means that your life is you know, uh, less enjoyable for sure, but if you're in the United States, uh, you're probably not going to starve to death just because you don't have a job. There's ways to get uh, food, um, whether it's really cheap food uh, or handouts or uh, you know, from people that just you know, want to help you out. Um, and then there's you know, government programs, which we'll talk about. Um, the homeless people have smartphones, almost all of them, uh, even though you know they don't technically have a, a, a regular job or even a house, maybe. Uh, so what it means to be poor now, which still sucks and is something that we're you know trying to help, uh, is way better than being poor 150 years ago. 150 years ago, being poor meant that I might starve to death or lack water uh, or shelter or any commodities I need to live. So uh, it's helped increase our standard of living. I would actually say too. Because stuff is uh, so widely available and cheap and people have more than they need, uh, it's a lot easier to help out those that are um, uh, on the lower end of, of, of luck or, or whatever happened in their lives. Uh, there's more incentives to like do things. Nice, yeah. Uh, excellent incentives, right? Um, I'm much more likely to try to innovate uh, or provide something because uh, I, I reap the reward for that as opposed to me handing it all to the government or my lord or, or whoever, you know, from the feudal system. All right, any others that we think of? This is a pretty good list. Let me see if we forgot anything, because these are all pretty good. Code of price, innovation, increased wealth, and living incentives. Yeah, if I remember anything else, uh, I'll mention it. Uh, I would say too, also, I'd add this, and I think we can agree. <clears throat> uh, did people's lives, after all this innovation <coughs> occurred, did they get better or worse? Better. better, right? So like things that we have now, like electricity, running water that you can drink, you know, uh, all, all of these things that are available, way better than not having them, all right? So that kind of goes to the standard of living. Um, but do people live longer or, or the same or shorter after all these, this stuff gets invented? Yeah, longer, but quite a bit longer, right? Because we, because of this innovation, we have new medicines, we figure out how diseases work, uh, how to, people are incentivized, and rewarded for uh, figuring out how to, to uh, um, come up with new medications or treatments, uh, so things like that. So we have a standard of living increase, but we also have a, an increase in uh, uh, life expectancy. Substantially, by the way. 
So like less infants dying in childbirth and mothers dying in childbirth uh, or dying just prematurely in, you know, as a young child or in their teens or even in their 20s. Life expectancy before the 19, uh, 1800s was like, depending on where you are, in your 30s, maybe 40s. Uh, old people were not that common. Dying, having siblings and friends that died before the age of 20 was, was common, happened routinely. Like, it, it's hard to imagine, because you guys all kind of grew up with each other for the most part, at least to, you might have been in a different school. Uh, but you know people at this school that you've gone through all the way through, whether you're Joseph Woodmer or wherever you're at. Um, it wasn't uncommon for a good chunk of you to just die along the way. And you know, the person you were in sixth grade with didn't even make it to, uh, to uh, what is now uh, middle school or, or high school. Uh, now that's really rare, and it's very sad when it happens. Uh, this really helped that. So those are great things. Yay, uh, free market capitalism for bringing those uh, to our lives. But there are also um, lots of <coughs> negative things. Here's a, here's a good, good point to make. Are these things here? <coughs> Do I see them instantly? No, these are super long-term benefits. So it's really hard to see them on a day-to-day -day basis, but they are absolutely there, especially if you look at it across time and decades. And we know that uh, these things uh, exist, but it's hard to see them every day. One thing that uh, you can see every day are some of these negative aspects of capitalism. And that's what we're talking about today. I should say free market capitalism, not capitalism itself. Uh, Laissez-faire specifically. Because we're going to find out that if you don't have any government involvement at all, and you just let everyone do exactly what they want with no regulation, there are some very uh, negative side developments that are not intended. So here's some of them. First of all, that working class that we uh, mentioned, uh, yay for them that they have a chance to get a job and earn money and, and buy things cheaply. That, that's a good thing. It's better than dying. Um, but... The conditions that they had to work in were, at least the 19th century, totally abysmal, all right? Um, guess how many days they were generally required to work a week? Seven. Not seven, because they usually give them Sunday off, but six, right? So the weekend you have now, um, which you know some people choose to work on or, or, or during, uh, was pretty much mandatory. If you were hired by an employer, you had to work uh, Monday through Saturday. They'd give you off Sunday for church, if you consider that fun. Um, I guess that's a day off, <clears throat> but uh, for the most part, you worked six days a week. Maybe that's not that bad if you're working like six to eight hours, all right? But how many hours do you think that they were working at these shifts? 12. Yeah, 12, sometimes 14. Um, the first time that they brought it down was to 10 hour days. Um, so they have six 10 hour days, but we didn't get the 40 hour work week till uh, after the uh, Great Depression or, or early 20th century, which we'll talk about later. But uh, here's just some of the things they had to deal with. Six days a week, <clears throat> and uh, 12 hour days, sometimes 14. How enjoyable do you think life is when you're uh, working literally almost all of your waking life? Yeah. Not super enjoyable. It's better than being dead, I suppose, in most cases, uh, depending on how you die, I guess. But um, this is uh, definitely something that people don't look forward to, and it's actually dangerous too, by the way. Why would this be dangerous? Because you're getting You are. What happens when you're overworked if you're a human? You're stressed. Okay, you do get stressed, and that helps your immune, it hurts your immune system and has long-term effects. I'm talking about, like, at the job that day. Why could this be dangerous to do all the time? Exactly. Yeah. If you make mistakes on a paper, oh well, you got that wrong. You got to fix it. I make mistakes on a, a bulldozer, a big piece of machinery. Uh, I could kill myself or damage something or kill somebody else. So these hours were too much to require people to work, and we know this now too. By the way, once you get past about the six-hour mark, well, actually the three-hour mark technically, but the six-hour mark for sure, there's a big drop-off in worker effectiveness. Like uh, that, that last two hours you work from six to eight hours. Uh, are generally very unproductive compared to the first, you know, three or four or five hours. Uh, and then you go 12 to 14, and yeah, screw that. Having me uh, do anything for 12 to 14 hours, like, there's a few hours in there that I'm just getting almost nothing done. <clears throat> so, they work extremely long hours. Um, how do you think their working conditions were? Trash. What do you mean trash? <laughs> like, uh, it wasn't, like, very sanitary. And okay, yeah, right. Unsanitary, certainly. Uh, and I would just say outright dangerous. And uh, I am not lying when I say that. Because unless I'm, like today, think about today. 
unless you're like a firefighter or a police officer or in the military. Uh, what else is a really dangerous job? Oh, technically freeway workers are the most dangerous job. Uh, I think Caltrans has the highest mortality rate for any job just because people, you know, skid off the road and, and hit the workers on the side of the road. Um, so unless you're uh, doing a job like that, which it's still relatively uncommon, do we worry about dying at work on a regular basis? No, right? Even those jobs that are technically that's part of the risk, uh, it's relatively low, the rates of death that they have. Injury may be higher, but, but certainly not death. Death and in in major injuries on the workplace uh, beforehand at any job that dealt with uh, factory work or mining or, or some sort of physical labor, incredibly dangerous <coughs> to the point that injuries were regular and death on the job was not uncommon uh, to occur. So I, I shouldn't be going to work at the Tesla factory and, and, and experiencing uh, the fear of dying because several people a year die at the factory or at the mine that I work at or on the skyscrapers that we build or, or whatever. All right, so there's no uh, regulations. So you have unsanitary conditions. Uh, so there's disease that's prevalent and you also have uh, just on the job threats that could just outright kill you. Uh, whether you're falling off a skyscraper because they're building those <clears throat> or you're uh, in an unregulated coal mine, you know, a mile under the ground and somebody hits the wrong thing and all the whole mine collapses and everybody in it's trapped and or dies. Uh, I'd rather die actually from the actual uh, being crushed because otherwise you're just stuck under there to uh, essentially starve or uh, die of thirst in the dark uh, over several days. So very dangerous conditions. Okay, what else sucked for them? Oh, let's say something did happen to me. I got sick from my job, like I got an infection because they're not sanitary. Like uh, they, they're, they're in a factory that like, um, what do they do? They uh, handle like food or, or meat or something like that, uh, or I'm in a mine or whatever, and I injure myself. A, ma a machine, you know, an accident happens because I'm, I'm too tired, the machine screws up, I lose an arm, uh, or I, you know, there's an accident in a mine, I lose a leg. Um, what's my situation gonna be like? in the 19th century, if I lost my limb from work. Okay, yeah, there we go. If you can even work, well, let's say you couldn't work, uh, you're, just, you're just screwed now. They're not gonna pay, likely, for the damages that happened to you, and they're certainly not gonna pay for you to uh, 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 live for the rest of your life uh, just because you were hurt on the job. So if you were hurt on the job back then, you pretty much just lost your job and now you don't have a job and now you have to somehow survive or pay for treatment and then also somehow have to continue surviving uh, by earning a living even though you're now missing an arm or fingers or a leg or, or whatever it might be. So we have essentially no, how can I phrase this, worker protection? Uh, we also have uh, no benefits for the most part. What do I mean, mean by benefits, by the way? There you go, yeah. So like health coverage, uh, retirement, that's a big one. Because I mean, if I'm 65, if I lived that long back then, I probably can't pull these kind of hours at a factory. Uh, and if I don't have a retirement plan or account or something like that, then I just get to starve to death or hope my family members can pay for me, right? So I have no benefits. That includes health care. There's none of that. Uh, retirement. Uh, and we also mentioned you, you're lacking the worker protection, the workers' comp. So, all right, this is enough to, uh, to point out how badly it is. Oh, actually, also, the living conditions, which we already talked about. Tenement houses, or probably worse, uh, company towns. Both of these suck. Uh, both of these are overcrowded. Crowded. Uh, uh, the construction is shoddy, so buildings collapsing, fires, things like that, or, you know, leaks in the roofs and, and not good insulation, so it's super cold in the winter and super hot in the summer. Those were common. Uh, usually, they didn't have sewage, which we talked about. So if I'm at a tenement house, I'm probably in a one-room studio with a family of six to 10 people, because they didn't have birth control back then. Um, so you just kept having kids as long as you continued your marital activities. The, the kids just kept coming. <clears throat> um, 
which actually worked out anyway because half of them died before they reached adulthood, so it's like we need to do that just to keep the population going. Yeah, so 19th century early on was, was not a happy place to exist in compared to now. Anyways, so you're in this one room apartment with a bunch of other families around you in this crappy building and you've got like one outhouse in the back outside that the entire place has to use. Uh, you have no running water, so you have to like go get the water and, and, and hope that it's not contaminated because back then they didn't quite know that you had to boil the water first to get all the pathogens out of it. Um, so the living conditions were awful. Or if you were unlucky enough to live in a company town where let's say, for example, you go get hired at a factory or at a mine or something, they'll actually provide shelter for you, which sounds nice, uh, except the fact that they build it specifically uh, for that work. So you're not gonna have a lot of recreational places there. It's pretty much just a place to live and do things you need to live. Uh, and also, uh, your work dictates your housing. So uh, they didn't have alarm clocks back then. Do you know how they woke you up, how, how people woke up for work? if there was no sun coming up, because they usually have to get up way before the sun came up. This is doing the hell out of me. Okay, I forget what they're called. It's escaping me for right now. I'm trying to remember, but I, I forget what they're called. But they would have people from the company go to your houses and like get you, like wake you up with a knock on your door or, or knocking on your window or using a, an air horn or whatever it might be to actually get you to wake up and, and go to work. Uh, and you can't call in sick or anything because they know exactly where you live and they can see you know, what's going on uh, with you. So uh, whether you're in a company town or you're in a tenement housing, you are incredibly unhappy. Okay, these things all suck and they don't exist today, uh, largely because uh, workers don't put up with it and uh, the government and uh, employers have had to either pass laws or make adjustments to fix some of these things, but they couldn't before. Um, how would normally, let's say I, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm a company owner and I have these conditions and you guys are the workers and, and you have to deal with them. It's better than being off in the country and, and you know, starving to death, uh, but it still sucks. What could you do to get me to change some of these things? Strike. Strike. Yeah, strikes. So you'd unionize, first of all, you'd organize yourselves, right? Be like, okay, we hate these things. Let's propose some changes, all right? It's got to be realistic, like I can't just give you everything because then my company will be profitable and then none of us have a job. So it's got to be like negotiated. The only way you can negotiate though is you have to unionize, right? Form a, 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 an organization or at least a, a united front and you can strike. Like if I refuse to change some things that you guys really want changed, uh, you can choose to not work, all right? That would stop me from making money. That's a, that's a really good, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Negotiating tool is uh, your labor. You could all organize and strike, and that prevents me from making any money, so then I kind of at least have to compromise or meet some of your demands. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right? like, you have to work for me to make any money, so if you stop working, then I've got to uh, meet you at least halfway on some of these issues, okay? Yeah, that's called striking. So the only way to fix these things are uh, through the use of unions and striking, organized labor, right? Which would work, that's fantastic. What if, though, you guys decide to strike and I just hire people to come uh, force you to go back to work? And if you don't, they beat you up uh, or potentially kill you. What are you guys going to do? Yeah, you're going to go back to work. Because, and you can say, oh, we'll fight back. So, oh, well, they have guns. And you almost certainly do not because you almost certainly cannot afford one. All right. Um, so, yeah, you're going to be forced to go back to work. Right? That's totally illegal. But if, and here's the big, big issue, if I am running on a laissez-faire economy, right, with no government intervention whatsoever, does the government have the right to say, oh, sorry, you can't do that as a company? No, they can't, right. <clears throat> and um, they might be able to, to argue something about violence, but we'll talk about why on the next slide. Um, it was not easy for workers to get the government to recognize that uh, these businesses did not have the right to force them to work. Uh, and use physical force to do that, which we'll, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So hopefully that one makes sense. These are the conditions that they're facing. You guys will write this one, and then I'll talk about uh, why the governments weren't able to stop. I've got a couple options if I want things to change as a worker, um, at least according to the laissez-faire system. I could, uh, I could strike, right? We already talked about that one. That's option number one. Uh, my second option could be could I potentially, if I don't like where I work, quit my job and go work somewhere else? You can't do that? So if I'm working at Target and I don't like what they're doing, I can't quit and go work at, I don't know, Save Mart instead? Can you do that for the most part? Yeah. 
You can, right, as long as there's jobs available. Uh, yeah, so that's the other option I have. I could strike and fight for it, or I could potentially uh, seek another job, right? If, you're, if your job's not responding or, or fairly treating you, <coughs> then uh, leaving is an option. I would suggest that option too, by the way. If you're ever in a situation in a career, um, and um, I'm talking more specialized, well, I could mean, I could mean uh, uh, entry level as well. If you're somewhere uh, and your employer is somehow uh, exploiting you, not listening to you, not, val thank you. not valuing you, or uh, like you feel you deserve a raise and maybe you do and they're not willing to give it or they give it to somebody else, whatever, um, you should seriously consider going somewhere else or at least getting hired somewhere else and using that as leverage to get your raise or, or what you want. Uh, and if, of course, they don't value you or they don't want to do that, then you should leave even though it might be difficult. But anyways, that's a separate issue. Uh, there's, there's their options. Nowadays, this would work, right? Because you can do both of these things. There's lots of jobs available. Um, uh, depending on the field, maybe it's harder, but you could, though it'd be difficult, go somewhere else if you're not happy there. Uh, or you could uh, organize and then uh, strike and then have a collective bargaining situation. Those were not actually options in the 19th century, though, unfortunately, for these workers. For two reasons. We'll go over the first one uh, first. Let's focus on this one. They could not utilize unions and strikes uh, in some states, particularly here in the United States. All right, Because if they tried doing that, they didn't get help or aid from the government. They actually were opposed by the government. So there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first one is the fact that the people who participated in the government, the ones that ran it in Congress, the presidents, etc., do you think that they were not uh, working class people in the 19th century in the 1800s? No, the, most of these jobs didn't pay any wages or at least not enough wages uh, for you to like leave your job and go uh, be a politician. These jobs were generally held by people that could afford to not physically be at work uh, or were wealthy enough from inheritance or whatever that they could just go be a politician. So most of the governments uh, were comprised of or uh, constituted of or, or run by of middle class people. And these middle class people believed that uh, having zero involvement by the government was the best policy. Uh, that was the, the um, theory of the time at the time. And, and who can blame them? Obviously these are terrible things. But uh, they had these on their side as being better than before when the government dictated what you could and couldn't do in guilds and, and the feudal system and all that. So they had a, a decent argument, but uh, these things were clearly a problem. Um, nonetheless, are they experiencing these middle class people that own the factories, or, or maybe they're just wealthy enough to the point that they don't have to work at all because they inherited from their family or whatever? Do these people really care about the plight of these people? Have they experienced it at all? No, they haven't, right? Their, their lives have not had to deal with these issues. Maybe they haven't even seen it themselves. They're not even aware of it, or they think that they're just complaining about something that's not worth complaining about, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, these were the people that made the actual laws. So they either made sure, because again, they pretty much ran the states and federal government, uh, they either made sure that the government wasn't involved by keeping them out, um, intentionally shooting down or not passing any laws that would help these uh, workers out, or they actually uh, did the reverse. They issued laws or used the military, in, in a couple cases, uh, to work against the workers uh, to maintain uh, this business system so it wasn't interrupted. Because they believe that, oh, at all costs, we have to maximize innovation, competitive pricing, and, and, and this uh, wealth cycle. We don't want it to stop. We don't want prices to halt or economic activity to halt. So all they want to do is keep those wheels moving uh, for capitalism. Right? They wanted railroads to keep running. They wanted houses to keep being built. They wanted uh, uh, businesses to keep operating. If I'm a railroad worker and we go on strike, What's going to happen to the railroad systems? Are they going to keep going if we're all on strike? No, they're going to stop, right? So that worried these guys. They didn't want their businesses and the economy to, to falter or stop or halt. So when workers would strike, instead of protecting their right to strike and negotiate, they would actually usually intervene on behalf of the business or the company instead of helping out the workers. So I, I gave you two examples, at least briefly in the jigsaw, of uh, two strikes where this happens. You've got the Homestead Strike. This is both in the late 1800s. 
These are steel workers uh, fighting for better wages um, in a steel mill in Pennsylvania. And the Pullman strike uh, for railroad workers, again, trying to fight for better wages and conditions. Both times when they went on strike, the company hired, I'm not exactly, I don't remember if the company hired people in the Pullman strike. I know they did the Homestead strike. The company hired, um, in this case, the Pinkertons to go and physically force them to go back to work to the point that if they resisted, the Pinkertons were actually well armed and uh, they could fire upon them. And they did actually do that, by the way. Uh, somebody threw a rock, one of the strikers threw a rock at these guys they hired to force them to go back to work. Um, and they probably, I know they should have just shot at them because they were unarmed, even though they were throwing rocks. Uh, they ended up shooting at them and they killed several workers, um, forced them to go back to work. Normally you would think, uh-oh, the company's in trouble. Government's gonna go get them, right? Because they shot a bunch of unarmed workers, but what actually happened? They ignored it. Not nothing, actually. The opposite of nothing. Something happened. The government went in, but do you think they helped out the workers? No, the government went in and forced them to go back to, the wor go back to work, basically. <laughs> they gave the steel mill back to uh, the company, uh, and it continued. That's why it's known as the Homestead Massacre. I hope we had that uh, answer on there, uh, because these workers were shot for striking, um, even though they might have been riled up and thrown rocks. They were shot and killed for striking and injured, and instead of the government like going after the company, and favoring the workers, uh, who were, at least in this case, certainly the victims, at least of gunfire, uh, they actually go in on behalf of the company and give them back their factory and the workers have to go back to work or, or find a work elsewhere. And we'll talk about why that's not really possible back then either. <clears throat> Same with the Pullman strike. The workers go on a strike and the federal government goes, well, we can't deliver our mail now, so, um, and the economy's suffering because our railroad systems aren't running. We can't transport goods. So they went in uh, and violently forced these workers to go back to work uh, for the railroad company. So not only were they not protecting the workers, but they did the opposite. They wanted to keep the uh, wheels of capitalism going, so they uh, actually helped out the businesses. So back then, either, depending on my country, unions and strikes were uh, banned and outlawed. Banned unions and strikes. So they were illegal, you would be uh, you know, imprisoned or punished for actually participating or organizing them. Or, in these cases, uh, the government used force uh, to uh, end strikes. To either give the business or factory back to the company or to continue uh, the railroads and operations of the economy. All right, so that's not really an option. Okay, um, my other option here is <clears throat> to seek another job. Why might that be a problem if I'm a railroad worker back then? Was that? Close. It does have to do with the job availability. All right. Back then, we had entities, which you guys had in the jigsaw yesterday, called monopolies. So monopoly is where, let's say my company is doing really well. I start a railroad business. Um, what I could do, and what they did do, is if I'm doing better than another railroad company, I could potentially either bully them out of business or I could buy them out. Why is that a bad thing if I let that continue? Like it's not, it's not bad if that happens. If I got two small companies that happens, it's like, you know, whatever. But if I let that keep going, what might occur? Exactly, yeah. If I let that trend continue, like again, if I have two small companies that happens with, not a big deal. It is a big deal though if that company buys another, it grows bigger, and then it buys another smaller one, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, are there any other railroad businesses in the area that can compete with me? Mm -hmm. No, why is that a problem? They can raise the prices. Yeah, they can screw me over as a customer. They can jack the prices up, uh, they can uh, reduce the quality because it doesn't matter, you don't even have an option. You just gotta go with that company because they're the only ones you know, within 500 miles of you, right? Or I would have a lack of innovation because if I'm the only one available to you and you have to buy from me, I'm not forced to innovate because you're still gonna buy my stuff anyway. Right, so we have uh, monopolies, which of course uh, kill competition by either legally or illegally absorbing other countries or bullying them out of business. Uh, they kill competition, quality, and innovation all in one swoop. So it's really, really bad for everyone when this happens. So let's say I am that railroad worker who goes on strike, and I'm like, you know what, screw it, I don't wanna work for this guy anyway, I'll go work at another railroad. Why is that not gonna work if there are monopolies? They own all the railroads around you, right? You have to go incredibly far to get to another company 
which is doing the exact same thing uh, that the company you left was doing. So monopolies made that sort of impossible or at the very least um, very difficult to do. <clears throat> and that's not just bad for workers, by the way. The monopolies are bad for everybody because, again, you lose that competition, so you have uh, no competitive pricing uh, or quality, right? I don't have to make a better burger or railroad or whatever. If, if all you can do is buy my stuff, there's no co competition. And I have no reason to innovate because you have to buy from me anyway. So we need competition for this to work, right? This whole ca capitalist system. And if there's no government making sure monopolies don't control everything, then uh, I'm, I'm not going to actually benefit from this actual system. All right, so that's a problem for workers trying to find other jobs. It's a problem for us as buyers because they can screw us over. All right, <clears throat> one last thing, and this is the uh, last one before the break. Aside from the fact that most governments were run by the middle class and they acted on behalf of the business, not the workers, or weren't involved, either one, both of those bad for workers, uh, and the monopolies, we also had politicians uh, taking bribes from these uh, same middle class people. Whether they were in the government or they were just paying people in the government uh, through bribery, uh, they were benefiting from this. And so this is called, uh, and you guys have it in the uh, jigsaw, cronyism or crony capitalism, right? This is where uh, business people bribe politicians, and then what do the politicians do with these bribes? Or not with the bribes, what do they do in return? Yeah, they, they are going to uh, help them in some way. There's lots of ways they can help them. They could potentially uh, give them access to super cheap land. They could pass a law uh, or a regulation or take one away that helps out that business. Um, what else could they do? They could uh, make them, give them tax benefits, all kinds of things that they could do. Uh, and this was absolutely uh, and definitely happening. One example we have is, is a super famous one because this happened, uh, it happened as high up as the presidency, or at least as advisors, it was the Teapot Dome scandal in the 1920s that you might have heard about in US history. You might have heard about these in US history too. Um, that was where, when the government is leasing or selling land, they're supposed to offer it in an auction competitively and companies bid for it. Uh, what he was doing, I forgot his name, he was taking US land, he was accepting bribes and not doing the auction. He would just give you the lease to the land to get the oil or whatever you needed. Uh, and He would just be paid directly by the company. Uh, they actually caught him and he went to prison for that. Um, but it was all throughout the government uh, occurring in some way, shape, or form. So I don't want to make it sound like every business or every person in the government was doing this stuff, but it was actually happening uh, at a noticeable rate. All right, again, so it doesn't mean every business person was a terrible, I hate you, I'm going to monopolize or destroy workers, or I'm going to bribe people in the government, or if I'm in the government, I'm accepted. Not everybody did that, but some people did, enough for it to negatively impact people, all right? Um, so these are all obviously problems that either are dreadful for the working class, dreadful for buyers, uh, or completely uh, break down the, the uh, tenets of how the system is supposed to work. So 19th century uh, pointed a lot of these issues out. So we're going to talk about um, tomorrow and next week is how people try to fix some of these issues. Because again, as bad as these are, this is better than feudalism and slavery and things like that, but we can definitely make this better, uh, and we have. So we'll talk about some of the theories tomorrow that um, were terrible and didn't work at all. Uh, and then next week, we'll talk more about options that did actually help. Um, yes, so these are the two slides. Uh, go ahead and get those. We'll take a break, and I'll do the last slide. Uh, Laissez-faire capitalism, no involvement. Some people also call it anarcho-capitalism. It doesn't exist in any country in the world because of the problems we mentioned, uh, which are too drastic for anyone to put up with it. Um, I mean, getting injured at work or whatever, and now you have to die as a result because you can't afford to, to work and feed yourself, it's a terrible thing, uh, as well as the other conditions they had to deal with. Um, what I want to know before I describe this last slide is, um, what was it called when business people would um, bribe politicians to get favors like tax breaks, leases on land, et cetera, low prices, or whatever it might be? Cronyism. Yeah, cronyism, well done. Uh, what about when <clears throat> one company would buy up or essentially gobble up all other smaller companies and then control all prices, quality, and of course not have to innovate because you have no options? Monopoly. Yeah, monopolies, nice. And uh, of course you have examples of that in steel and oil and railroads and from like US history examples like Rockefeller, or Carnegie, Vanderbilt, guys like that. Um, we don't need to go in that, that's for history class. How about 
why did the government either not interfere, or if they did interfere, they helped businesses out uh, by force when people went on strikes? They wanted to keep the <clears throat> Okay, yeah, they want to keep the capitalist economy running, absolutely, they didn't want to stop it. Okay, cool. Um, I want to know more about the people that comprise the government, because they, like, banned unions or would act against them. Like, who was in the government that wasn't working on behalf of the uh, working class people? Middle class. Yeah, it was mostly middle class people, at least in the United States anyway, uh, that were in the government. So they don't experience or necessarily care about these issues, uh, or they may be taking bribes. Okay. <clears throat> so those are terrible things. The question is, why would people think that it's okay to do that? Uh, and they did. In fact, it's so, uh, at least backwards now to us, that they thought if you went out and helped the poor working class and stopped the richer middle class from monopolizing things or, or controlling an industry or, or setting wages, that it was immoral. They thought it was actually immoral to stop people from abusing or preventing the working class from helping themselves out. Why on earth would they think that was immoral? Because pretty much everyone agrees that if you're stopping somebody from getting something, whether it's buying them out or uh, forcing them to use a certain price or preventing them from organizing, that you're actually the one that's in the wrong there. Why would they think it's the opposite? They actually thought it was immoral to help the poor class out. Ooh, very close. It, but it, it kind of has to do with the same theory. So this one's actually called social Darwinism. But I like that you mentioned that. I didn't even think about that. It's very similar to the feudal system. All right? Why didn't, during the feudal system, I'm going to give you points for that, just for drawing that conclusion. <clears throat> uh, why did the feudal system not give any rights to uh, peasants to like run governments and things like that? Why did they only give it to nobles and royals? Yeah, they thought they were inferior, you know, because like God gave them intelligence or wisdom or whatever the hell it might be. All right, this is a very similar um, policy. So it doesn't believe that like you're born into a class that makes you this, um, because those don't exist now. There's no like you can't be born into a, a social class and, and be stuck there, you know, in the United States or in a capitalist system. Uh, but you can be a part of a class. You can join one by becoming wealthy or losing your money and going to the poor class, whatever it might be. Uh, so you can move in it, but they still believe that if you were at the top, it wasn't because, um, or no, let me rephrase that. They thought if you were up at the top, you were the middle class, right? Up here and down here be the working class. They thought if you were here, since no one gave it to you by birthright, you earned it. So they believed, and that's not exactly true, we'll talk about that in a second, they believe that if you earned your way here, whether you started here or you started here, whatever, if you're up here, you're only there because uh, you um, earned it through either ability or um, uh, work ethic or both. So they thought, if I'm here, it's because I'm a good hard worker or I'm a smart person, I'm good at what I do. That's why I own a company, run a company, and buy out of the ones, because I'm better than them. <clears throat> if I'm down here, it's because uh, you are uh, essentially inferior. You're either uh, unintelligent or dumb, however they want to phrase it, uh, or you're lazy. They literally thought poor people were stuck there because they were lazy or dumb, and that middle class people were there because they were uh, smart or gifted or work at, had a good work ethic. All right. That might be partly true, uh, that people get here through ability, uh, but back then it wasn't just pure ability. There were other factors too. Like for example, we just talked about some. If I happen to get there first for whatever reason, if I'm in the railroad business, it doesn't matter if I have a better idea for railroads because they're not gonna let me exist. They're gonna buy me out or bully me uh, uh, or, or come up with some other way of making it so that I can't operate uh, and can't even actually earn my way here uh, in the first place. Uh, so that's sort of how they started forming this idea. So social Darwinism actually is a very, very incorrect interpretation of the old Darwin's theory on natural selection or survival fittest. That is essentially uh, how evolution works, right? Um, something in the environment changes, and uh, the species that are the strongest, I don't mean physically strong, I mean like best able to survive, whether they're smarter or faster, they eat a certain food that exists and another one might not exist, whatever. They survive, and the weak perish. 
they believed that uh, this was Darwinism on a like social level. They applied it to society and culture and morals. Totally incorrectly, by the way. Uh, we're individuals, not groups. But anyways, we'll get into that later. So they thought that if you went in and tried to help this class out by increasing their wages to the government or forcing companies to give them benefits uh, or breaking up monopolies, that you were actually interfering with a natural process and that you were in the wrong. You were immoral for trying to act on behalf of uh, uh, this class. All right, so any interference at all, whether you're breaking up a monopoly or you're um, uh, forcing companies to have safer working conditions or better wages or allowing the unions to work, that it was interfering with this natural process that was working towards like a perfect, better, uh, more efficient world, basically. All right, and we, we know that's wrong because, I mean, people are going to uh, run with this idea uh, take it to the extreme, and that's, I mean, li literally this was like the doctrine of Hitler, except he used races, not classes, and said, here are the Aryans, and here are everyone else, so therefore we should just eliminate everybody else. Uh, it was the exact same thought process, and actually communism kind of does too in a different way, which we'll talk about tomorrow, uh, but uh, we know this is wrong now, absolutely. <clears throat> but back then, they thought that uh, it was a good thing, an immoral thing, to uh, allow these guys to do whatever they do because clearly they're only there because they are superior intellectually or by ability or by work ethic and if you're stuck down here sucks for you I guess you're just poor or, or sorry you're either dumb or lazy or, or whatever reason that you're down there all right and we know it's way more complicated than that especially if uh, someone's preventing you actually from you know rising up to this occasion by stealing your ideas or bullying you or or buying you out or, or whatever um, so that's what social Darwinism is, and the reason why I mentioned this is because, I mean, I would think anyways, like, why the hell did people think that it was a good idea to allow these things to exist? This is why. They actually thought it was a, a moral uh, and good purpose to allow this to happen, all right? 